Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we, were, we will be discussing a network of organizations that help make cancer care accessible to more patients. We're featuring guests, Patricia Goldsmith, CEO of Cancer Care Incorporated in New York, Anna Gottlieb, founder and executive director of Cancer Pathways in Seattle, and Lori Willis, executive director of the Cancer Foundation of Santa Barbara in California, one of the largest contributors to the Ridley, uh, Ridley Tree Cancer Center. So thank you all for joining us this morning. It's really important to talk about cancer, cancer care, how cancer affects families, and how we can make this care more accessible and affordable to everyone. So let's just sort of set you up. We're going to go to you, Patricia, first. Uh, and I just want to set this up by saying and recognizing the fact that a cancer diagnosis can completely change lives. It'll uh, change the life of the people uh, directly affected and then their circle of friends, their families, certainly uh, caregivers. And, and so let's talk about how uh, cancer affects Americans and how it affects lives. Patricia, can you just talk with us uh, a little bit about how you see that point of receiving a cancer diagnosis and how you respond and how you help others navigate these issues. Certainly, and thank you for inviting me, Mark. Very happy to comment on that. I think I'll start answering by sharing uh, a personal experience. And that is that for my entire career, I have been primarily focused in the cancer arena, either in academic medicine or now at cancer care. And so I've been very accustomed to supporting individuals, hearing from individuals. But I remember like yesterday, the day when I heard you have cancer, it literally changes everything. And it impacts your entire world and the world of those around you, whether that's your loved ones, your family members, your children, don't forget about your employer, your colleagues at work. Literally, it is a life-changing diagnosis in some circumstances for me, and for me in some ways, a gift. And so for us, Cancer Care is a 77-year-old organization. And what we do is provide help and hope to anyone that has been impacted by a diagnosis of cancer. And that is through psychosocial support, education, a lot of financial assistance, and many other programs. These are very common human experiences. You know, we all think that we're um, immune until it happens to us, right, Patricia? That's correct, absolutely correct. And honestly, you really don't think about it um, or per se worry about it in the same way that, um, that perhaps some individuals, I did not. And I will tell you that when I heard those words, I was not sitting there thinking I was afraid to die, mm -hmm. but whether I was concerned about what will I tell my employer? it was 10 days before I started my CEO role at Cancer Care that I received this diagnosis out of the blue. Um, but I have to tell you that I have so far, anyhow, a happy ending. And what I would say is as crazy as it sounds, it's enriched my life by making me realize how blessed I am, how valuable precious moments are and how important it is to help anyone who's been impacted by a diagnosis of cancer. Anna, what is your experience of, of that, those inflection points and how do you respond uh, over in Seattle? Well, our organization, Cancer Pathways, does a lot of what Patricia was saying. We really, for me, my mother had cancer when I was a young child and I, that feeling never leaves you ever. And I always hoped that there was a better way to deal with cancer than whispering and closed doors and not talking to your kids about it. And for us, family focus is very important. We have a lot of programs for families. The one thing about cancer that has struck me over the many years is there's no explanations. There's no rules of cancer. 
absolutely not one of us is immune to cancer. It can happen anytime. And when you're part of a family, everybody's diagnosed, whoever gets the diagnosis. And we work a lot with children, with teenagers, with adults in different programs. We have summer camps for kids whose parents have cancer, have lost a parent to cancer. You know, we tend to see kids say, I'm okay, I'm okay, and they're not okay. And those things last a lifetime and we need to deal with them up front and make sure that everybody is getting the help they need. And that includes everybody in the family and your friends and your colleagues and your neighbors and everybody, as much cancer as there is, I'm always surprised at how inept we are talking about it and asking questions. And none of us know what to say because we're all afraid we're gonna say the wrong thing. And as most people will tell you, saying nothing is the worst thing you can do. So we really try to help people communicate. One of the reasons why we wanted to have uh, you on, Laurie, is because as a fundraiser, as someone who actually needs to talk about cancer to, to everyone, right? You are basically functioning as a, a pushback against silence. Right. I mean, one of the things that that we're talking about is advocating for income redistribution. Right. What we're saying is there's a, there's a need that we all have. We all since we all have the need, we're all affected by this, as we are in so many other civil society issues. We all need to be engaged. Right. Yeah, it's really, really important. And both of you ladies, that was beautifully said um, as far as a cancer diagnosis goes and how it affects you and your family and everyone in it. Um, as, as a person on the outside, um, as the fundraising arm of the Cancer Center, raising funds for programs and services in our building that are not covered by insurance and are free to anyone in our community. And so we provide those services for those families. And I'm sure both of you have the same thing, social services, patient navigation, to be able to have someone to talk to and um, when they're going through this cancer diagnosis and whether it's counseling, support groups, my organization, we cover all those costs for the patients and their families. And you know, I also had, when I was 14 years old, my mother was diagnosed and she never talked about it. And she died at, at 75 years old with four different kinds of cancer in her lifetime. Um, and so this is why I got into this work, because I'm so passionate about being an advocate to support patients, families, like you said, their children. We also help with camps for kids that they just go to camp. It's called Camp Kessem and, and they can be around other kids that their parents have had cancer. And I think all of us being able to have somebody on our team and it takes a village to be able to feel good about what's happening. Great doctors, great technology, I mean, research, things have progressed so much farther since when our parents got cancer into where they are today. And I think we're just in a, in a great time to be able to help so many more people. And, um, and it's just a wonderful feeling at the Cancer Center that I work for that we are able to do that here in Santa Barbara. Patricia, could you talk a little bit about health outcomes and treatment regimens um, and, and what determines uh, health outcomes and who has access uh, to, to different forms of treatment? Because it seems to me that um, we, we enter into a diagnosis from very often similar positions, not identical positions, but similar positions. But then as we go through our care, given the, the incredible expense and the length of these treatments, there is a sorting that goes on that uh, where people uh, then have to deal with other types of trauma, trauma of financial distress, uh, trauma of bankruptcy, uh, trauma of going and soliciting uh, friends and neighbors for help, um, trauma of trying to hold the job. Could you talk a little bit about uh, what creates these different experiences among your, uh, your the constituents and patients? Mark, it's a very, very complicated issue. And I guess if I had to say one word or use one word to describe this, I would probably focus on the word access, but access in the broadest sense. It is access to a support system, access to appropriate insurance, access to the kind of care 
that an individual needs, access to support from an employer, a family, et cetera. Now, one thing that I think is really important to talk about that really has the potential to dramatically impact access is health insurance. And I actually believe that the concept of health insurance as we've known it is almost becoming a misnomer. So let me talk to you about, uh, sort of use a comparison here. So if we're a homeowner, typically all of us have homeowner's insurance and you buy a policy and you agree to a certain deductible and you assume that that company will be there. So let's just say that there's a terrible windstorm and your roof suffers damage and you think, okay, I have a thousand dollar deductible. You call the insurance company. Well, hold on a second. Yeah, it's a thousand dollar deductible, but that's only if your roof is black, yours is gray. Oh yes, it's a thousand dollar deductible, but it's only if it's asphalt shingles. Individuals when faced with a diagnosis of cancer have so many complexities and access very quickly gets determined by their insurance coverage or lack thereof. And that can be insurance coverage with respect to deductibles, with what the insurer will or will not cover. Then there's ge geographic access. If you live in a rural community and you need to go to an academic cancer center or participate in a clinical trial, access is extremely difficult. Then there's the inevitable larger out-of-pocket costs that may be related to transportation, childcare, taking time off of work. Do you have access to those funds? So in all of these circumstances, in order to support a cancer patient, it does really take a village and a system of care of that individual that isn't just related to what happens in the four walls of the clinician's office. So Anna, you're, you're a totally different uh part of the country. Does yes. this sound alien to you? It does not. For us, what we've seen, really the word access can mean life or death. It's, yeah. that, it, it's that stark. It really does mean life or death. And, you know, if a family has to choose between rent or food or medicine, medicine comes in last usually. And I think this past year, we have seen the disparities in this country elevated so much. And we've seen people who are diagnosed with cancer who won't even go to the doctor, who can't afford to go to the doctor, who present themselves at stage four. And that's a huge problem. It's going to become a bigger problem because many people skipped their screenings this past year. Um, very low screenings for mammograms, colonoscopies, and skin cancer. And it's going to be a lot of presenting of stage four cancers in this country. And access is going to be the key as to who can get treated and who can't get treated. And for what we see, people fall through the cracks every day. No matter how great your insurance is, you still have out-of-pocket costs that will cause bankruptcy. And cancer is the number one reason for bankruptcy medical issues in this country. And I think that's going to be even worse this next few years. Are you saying, Anna, that we have a systemic issue that needs to be systemically um, dealt with? Or can we deal with it by relying on uh, people like Lori in terms of fundraising and doing it through private voluntary donations um, that, that people can either contribute to or not contribute to. How do, I, how do you see it? I, I see it as, as it's great, all the fundraising, but sometimes it doesn't reach the right people. And the right people don't even know how to access those services. And that's where we're really falling down. We need to make sure that everybody in rural areas has that kind of access. If you don't have a cancer center to go to or a doctor to go to, or you can't afford it, you're not going to go. And so I think we are not reaching all the right people in this country. And that's what we really have to work on. I'd love it if, if uh, other attendees uh, would weigh in. Lori, um, how do you feel? You're a fundraiser. Do you feel like um, you have to be the tip of the spear and figure out, uh, you and your colleagues have to figure out how we fund cancer? Or do we need to have a systemic all-in um, uh, approach to, uh, to healthcare for 
uh, so that so that it's accessible, whether it's cancer or other um, other diseases, that it's accessible to more people. How do you see it? Yeah, I think um, you know it's very interesting in in Santa Barbara, California. We have a, a whole population of Latino and Hispanic, and one of the biggest things that we work with other organizations, uh, a clinic here called the Neighborhood Clinics, that does outreach to educate the community. And I think that uh, there is also fear that they may not have, um, they may not be a citizen or a resident, so they wanna hide. And to let them know that our cancer center in Santa Barbara is a, is a community cancer center for anyone. And so we are, we are boots on the ground. We try to get out there and help. And, and, and our organization says, we'll, we'll fund cancer care for anybody. We just need to get them diagnosed. Um, and I think it was great what you said. I mean, I was doing a, a, some homework yesterday on the American Cancer Society. 1.9 million people will be diagnosed with cancer in 2021. And like you said, stage four, because they were fearing to come into the cancer center um, or they couldn't come because of COVID or they were only told they could come by themselves or they didn't have a bilingual translator that could help them. Um, so I think education is a huge piece to, to everything we do in the population out there and letting them know that just because you've given a cancer diagnosis doesn't mean you're gonna die. Um, and I think that's where people are so afraid is um, they don't wanna be a burden, um, but uh, you know, out there just trying to help educate folks with marketing or getting in those social networks that um, we can tell their family and friends, tell them to come, please come. You know, if you felt a lump or something, please, please don't wait, please don't wait, come in. So um, yeah, it's a big piece to, to getting the word out about cancer care. And I'm you're sorry, making- I, If I can add for just a moment, since the concept um, has come up about the absence of screening and the severe drop off in screening rates across mm -hmm. this country. And there is a real, this is a tsunami potentially that is coming. And I just wanna uh, mention for our audience that Cancer Care in collaboration with an organization called the Community Oncology Alliance has launched a national program called Time to Screen with a call to action for individuals to go back to screening. Our spokesperson is Patty LaBelle. And with this campaign is an 800 number that provides very high touch services to anyone who calls, of course, free of charge, to help them navigate through their fears of getting back to screening. And we literally find open screening centers across the country and will help schedule low cost or no cost screenings. So that's a really important program right now because this is very concerning. That is wonderful. We are, um, we're, we're at the end of a, of a poll in which we talked about screening and uh, we asked uh, how many people had not received um, uh, screenings in this last year and the majority had, to, um, we found that 62% had received uh, screenings within the last four years. Uh, how often should people be screened, uh, Patricia? It depends upon personal circumstances, Mark. So it depends upon certain risk factors. As an example, if an individual is a smoker, there may be appropriate lung cancer screening. There's changing guidance with respect to, for example, colorectal cancer screening. I'm a colorectal cancer survivor, so I pay great attention to this. So it used to be that the screening guidelines were 50, but we're starting to see a, an increase in colorectal cancer in younger adults those guidelines are changing. And so that's really, I don't think we should articulate a roadmap that's one size fits all, but it's gotta be a discussion with your clinician or reaching out to time to screen for us to help you determine what the best met, uh, screening approach is for your individual circumstances. And remembering that each, uh, each transaction also comes with a cost, right? And so uh, affordability is, is so important. We, uh, we, we got a comment by uh, Maureen McNeil. I, I thought it was phenomenal. She basically says that, that um, uh, access to care across communities should remain at the forefront of the conversation. Uh, which uh, I think is, is, is really important. We chose three leaders from 
areas of the country that are very prosperous and that have access to excellent medical care. Uh, but all communities within those regions don't have that access um, based in, in wealth, and access to insurance and so on. And then if you take a look at the center of the country uh, where distances uh, between care facilities can be very, very high, you have uh, similar issues uh, of access. Uh, Anna, if, if we take a look at trying to change things, um, what do you think is the first second and third thing that we should be looking at. I mean, affordability is a big issue. Insurance, you've already mentioned that. But we also have the physical distance. We have other barriers to entry. We have education um, so that people understand what their options are. What other uh, measures could we take as a society so that our fellow citizens are healthier and receive better care? Well, what we see a lot is we live in a big city. But if you go 30 minutes from here, access stops. Right. And as you go throughout the state and throughout the Northwest, it's a lot harder to find a place to go, to afford a place to go, to have transportation to go to, to have language barriers. And I think we need to reach out to those communities in those states that are left behind. And I think that would make a really big difference. We do, we're, we're in the middle of a, of a uh, poll in which we ask um, uh, what would make cancer treatments more accessible to more people. And it's interesting, we have um, uh, pretty much an even response on three uh, items, regulated prices on prescription drugs, FDA should increase approval of generic treatments and health insurance should automatically cover cancer treatment. Uh, Lori, how do you see it? How do you see the, this whole idea of accessibility? Is this really a matter of different elements of cost? Or is this also a question of the approach to providing treatment to uh, individuals? I think it's both. I mean, you know, the cost, I think the, the biggest fear is, you know, I think one of your questions or we had talked about is cancer care is very expensive. Um, I, I think one of the things that my organization does to also to help, I mean, we, we, all, we all talk about family history, right? So, I mean, if we, we all look at our own family history and we think, okay, my mother had breast cancer, my aunt had breast cancer, my grandmother had breast cancer. I mean, those are reasons enough that we should get genetic counseling or get genetic testing. Um, if we can educate the community and we can provide those services for free that somebody would be interested in taking a swab or a blood test to actually get a family history as a baseline. Um, and, you know, and health and diet are important, exercise is important, all of those things. Um, and cost shouldn't be, an, shouldn't be an issue. I mean, we should be able to provide services for everybody who has been diagnosed with cancer care um, and be able to support those people any way we can. And I think I was struck with the COVID vaccine, how fast it came out and how free it was and how accessible it was. Mm -hmm. And if we could translate some of what happened into some cancer care, I think we could go a long way. Right. Well, I think that, that it also uh, points out that when, um, when danger is high and shared and when um, money is available, mm -hmm. uh, so much can be moved, right? So. Right. You know, th there are treatments within our grasp, but there is not necessarily the will. We're wasting a lot of energy, I think, in, in uh, silly debates when we could be providing more medical care at a lower cost. Uh, Patricia, if you were to have the uh, ears of our various uh, warring factions uh, in Capitol Hill, what would, your, what would your recommendation be for improving uh, accessibility, as you point out, uh, one of the major issues when it comes to cancer? So I don't think there's any one magic formula, but there's a couple of things that I would say. I think that we have to look at the entire system of delivery of cancer care. This is one thing I know. We all want to have a better life, a longer life, or potentially finding cures for cancer. And there's only one industry that that's going to come from. That's the pharmaceutical industry. And right now, there's a whole lot of vilification going on of the pharmaceutical industry. Some of it deserved, okay? But we just brought up the COVID vaccine. If it wasn't for Pfizer or Moderna, we wouldn't have those vaccines. That happened at a record pace because everybody shared a common goal 
of getting that vaccine out and getting Americans vaccinated. If we had that same common goal across the entire delivery system of cancer, from the insurers, the pharmacy benefit managers, the manufacturers, the federal government, and the providers, and we could figure out a roadmap in much the same way we did with respect to the COVID vaccine, the world would be a lot better place. And the other thing I'll say with respect to the cost issue is there are there is very little transparency in the real cost of pharmaceuticals, as an example, what the PBMs take, what the manu what the insurers make, you know, the pricing of cancer services at different facilities. That all has to change. And I'm afraid that we're reaching that crisis point with respect to affordability and at a time where we know because of COVID, we're gonna see a lot later stages of diagnosis. But let's just keep our eye on the goal and figure out how we can get there as opposed to all the finger pointing vilification while people are suffering and dying. Um, Anna, could you comment uh, very briefly on this whole uh, idea that we've heard floated that the high cost of, of American uh, health care and insurance uh, uh, policies and so on, they help in, the, in, in keeping us very advanced in terms of care regimens and development of drugs and so on. So basically, we're paying a lot so that we have access to, to advanced research. And that's the justification for why costs are so high. Um, how do you see th see this, or do you feel like it's a that the trade off isn't isn't as direct as some people assert? Well, one thing I think we have to keep in our minds at all times is there are, there's nobody immune to cancer. There's nobody that doesn't know somebody with cancer that hasn't had cancer. It is a crisis. And we are not dealing with that crisis the way we dealt with COVID, the way we saw people could get access to get treated with no care for cost. And I think it would be really nice now to translate that into cancer world because that's what we need to see happen. It's possible. Republicans get cancer, Democrats get cancer. There's just nobody that's immune. And, and that's what we always tell people you don't know what's gonna happen when you wake up tomorrow morning. And we need to watch out for each other. We need to be able to have a system where if you think you have cancer, if you wanna get screened, you can walk in anywhere and get that kind of a test or that kind of a treatment. I think it's possible. I know it's possible. I just think we have to get the right people working on it. We work with our legislature every year and we try to move things along. Uh, yes, it's can be slow, but I'm hoping it goes a lot faster now. Lori, um, we're gonna give you the last word since we're coming to the end of our time. If you were going to pitch me, I'm a guy, I don't have cancer. If you were going to pitch me, why should I give to a cancer organization? Well, I think, um giving in my cancer organization, if you lived in Santa Barbara and you wanted access to the best possible health care, not having to go to LA, San Francisco, or Paso, you know, somewhere five hours north, um, we have everything you need right here. I mean, we have the latest and greatest technology. We are implementing a new, we're personally buying a new PET CT scanner going from analog to digital. Um, there are so many reasons to invest in our cancer center here. So you don't have to go anywhere else. Um, you can get your cancer care here, you can get your radiation, you can get your chemotherapy, you can get your support systems. And it's in, a, it's in, the, in the, you can just leave your home when you're in radiation therapy, everybody knows you go every day for six months, six weeks, six months, it just depends. So having this kind of care in such a, an amazingly small community of 400,000, um, and if you lived here, we, we'd hope you would invest in it so we can continue to bring the latest and greatest technology to the forefront and to be here in Santa Barbara without having to leave your home. I can go out to dinner, yep. buy the next product that I really don't need. I can yep. upgrade grade my wardrobe or I can help save someone's life. Yeah, you can. Saving a life is really important. Thank you so much. Uh, Patricia Goldsmith, CEO of Cancer Care in New York City. Um, Anna Gottlieb, founder and executive director of Cancer Pathways in Seattle. 
and Lori Willis, Executive Director of, Can of the Cancer Foundation of Santa Barbara in California. Fornia, thank you so much for helping us to understand the issues surrounding cancer and to perhaps position ourselves for greater support of organizations and of, of people who are uh, living with cancer every day. It's just been so wonderful to uh, tap into your knowledge here today. And thank you, we're in your debt. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.